yeah, sort of an olfactory evolutionary development there. <laughs> Blocking out smells, I don't know. Hawk watchers, specializing in seeing for any specks in the sky. Computer watchers, I don't know. I think Cornell is uh, working on computers to attach right to computer watchers so that they can send in their data <laughs> if they're seeing it. Songbirds, which is sort of where I started. Um, the migra migrations of songbirds and warblers is very addicting and fascinating phenomenon. Night migration, more of a newer uh, phenomenon. That's what uh, we're going to be talking about. Night migration. Well, you know, I think it's only about 50 to 70 years ago that it really became apparent that most bird migration happens at night while they sleep. And this is the songbirds. Um, but almost everything, even sometimes raptors have migrated at night. One of the earliest forms of studying night migration was um, putting a, a telescope or binoculars on a full moon on a, on a fall migration night and seeing the birds go by. Mm -hmm. Acoustic monitoring goes way back. Imagine Native Americans, uh, first people in these places that we're at right now, on the ridges, wherever, <coughs> um, thousands of years ago, undoubtedly hearing these phenomena, um, the vocalizations of birds in night migration. Radar, coming out of World War II, really developing out of World War II, really showing the expanse of uh, birds and other things flying around at night in the atmosphere. Thermal imaging, the heat, studying the heat um, of birds. It's amazing how far with a thermal imaging camera you can see birds a thousand feet away, little songbirds migrating overhead. So avian night migration evolved out of uh, favorable circumstances. There's the economy of flying at night in that a lot of, most of our birds feed during the day. So if they flew all day, then they'd have to rest all night without refueling. So for songbirds, it's much more, um, much, much uh, easier if they migrate at night. And, and then they can feed berries, uh, insects during the day. And uh, you know, I might just turn this off. I haven't listened to this yet. And I'm not sure what we're going to run into. It could be a car coming by. Um, the other thing about night migration is avoiding predators. You have merlins. Uh, sharp shin hawks, a lot of um, raptors that specialize in eating small songbirds. So, and they have no cover if they're flying a long distance down in Central or South America at night. So, uh, I mean, during the day. Um, so, if they migrate at night, um, it's, uh, they have that advantage of avoiding predators. And I put many here because it Fairly recently, it was discovered there's a species of bat in Europe that actually preys on night migrating songbirds. No. I don't think that happens here in North America. The other thing is physically easier at night, it's cooler and the air is less turbulent. Um, and the utility of using celestial navigation on, um, on, long, on long flights. Now these birds in night migration are flying generally over the lay of the land. Um, there's migrations down the valleys. Uh, in, in Vermont, um, but they're not flying over hills and, and into the valleys like this. They're, they get above the lay of the land and they just fly and they get into sort of a, uh, a rhythm where they, um, uh, where it's relatively easy for them and they don't have to keep continually adjust to things. Remember, they can't see each other. Um, and they can't see objects. They've got to get above trees. They've got to get now above wind turbines. They've got to get above mountains. So uh, one of the things that spawned out of the uh, development of radar in World War II was weather radar. And now we have this amazing system of weather radar across the US called NEXRAD radar. And you can see we have a few dots up here near Vermont. I'm not exactly sure where that one is up there, up near Burlington maybe. Um, Camp Johnson. Camp Johnson. Camp Johnson. And this was last night uh, across the continent. Now, radar basically is like taking a flashlight, but it's using a uh, wavelength of electromagnetic radiation that we can't see. 
and it shoots that around and it listens for reflections and then it, through computer algorithms, it can paint the picture of what's coming back. Now what comes back is what reflects off water. Um, so any biological organism flying in the atmosphere at night can get picked up by the next rep. And of course, rain, rain can get picked up. So birds, bats, and bugs, that's what this is. Um, but the targets can be um, uh, generalized to mostly birds sometimes if you look at the flight speed of the targets. And there's another mode of NEXRA that allows you to see the speed of the targets. You can access this map if you go to your uh, web browser and type in NCAR Radar Archive. They have from all those dots around the country, they have the last five nights archived. And if you click on the continental link, you can see, right now, you can see this instant, instantly anywhere across the continent. So here's basically a big bird migration last night, mostly birds probably, not as much up where we, we are. But again, this is looking, it has a slight angle. So when you see these big uh, blooms like this, a lot of that is fairly high in the atmosphere. Um, it doesn't mean we didn't have migration here last night, but it might have been below uh, the ability of radar to see it. And of course, radar can't see through mountains, so Vermont is not really a radar-friendly state. We have these mountains. With very specialized radar, you could probably study what's migrating along the valleys. Is that the hurricane off the coast? There's the hurricane uh, this afternoon. That's the forecast. So this is the forecast map for this afternoon. So you see here's a cold front, and here's the high with the winds going uh, clockwise. And this big bird migration happened last night here. It's following this high pressure. The hurricane here with counterclockwise winds also might have brought us in. We had sort of an easterly wind. This would have been a little bit further south last night. Um, I don't know what happened last night here. The, um, we didn't get the recording. but. Um, so this cold front is going to sweep across the state uh, tonight. And by tomorrow morning, it's going to be through northern Vermont. I think tomorrow morning is going to be an excellent birding morning here, because there'll be a nice wave of migrants following that cold front. There's going to be some clouds, maybe some light rain as that comes in in the morning. And I don't know, it looks really good tomorrow morning. Not that it's bad today, but um, it, looks, it looks really good. Sorry. That's right. Um, with all the winds from the hurricane, does that mean that we're going to have some unusual for here birds? No. no. No, it wasn't close enough. Oh. The hurricane has to get closer with those strong winds to, I mean, it's not impossible that something could get pushed down the St. Lawrence and then eventually find its way through Vermont, but I wouldn't be out looking for hurricane birds today or tomorrow or from this hurricane in general. Can I ask a question about the, the radar? Sure. But I, I, I don't need you to go back and um, if So it was primarily in the east. Is that the slide's focus to be primarily in the east to show? Or was there just not as much happening in the west? Um, this is from 10 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. In the so west, we subtract two or three hours. It hadn't taken off yet. So gradually. Yeah, if you look at later in the night, see blooms here, but the blooms out west generally aren't as big. They, they don't have the same density of night migrants as we do here in the east. Mm -hmm. um, we just have a tremendous number of birds migrating overnight. And it seemed like you were correlating the, the bigger blooms in the middle of the country that you're seeing there with that area of high pressure. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's going to move over. So theoretically, we might get those big blooms tonight or certainly tomorrow night. It looks like the cold fronts will be on top of us tonight. So would Ohio have gotten yesterday or this morning? Yeah, uh, Ohio could have gotten out last night. So this is, let's see, this is the forecast for this afternoon. So actually the cold front isn't going to go through Ohio until tonight. So tomorrow would be really good in Ohio. Now, birds, if it's light winds like it was last night, it's sort of a light easterly wind here, the warblers are still going to go. They are programmed to go at a certain time of the year, and they'll go um, if the flying's good. They're not going to go if there's a strong south wind. So that's a day not to necessarily go out birding the next morning. But if you pay attention to the weather, you can really optimize your birding. 
Um, if, you know, when you really get the fever like Richard does, you want to be out every day. But you can't because work, work and life uh, gets in the way. So you need to maximize your birding by paying attention to the weather. So when you go out, it's good. And there's all sorts of tricks uh, of where to bird and things like that on, uh, that are sort of correlated with weather. All right, so we've discussed radar, which is an active form of studying night migration. Acoustics is passive. As I remember, the first peoples here heard these flights, undoubtedly. They might have uh, listened to geese coming over and think, OK, the geese are back. Now we can finally get something to eat after it's like getting through the whole winter. I don't know what they thought. I don't think anyone does, um, especially with things like warblers. What did they think of warbler ship notes at night? Did they know, you know, people couldn't travel back then. So the first peoples here didn't know that these birds went to South America and Central America. Um, but they experienced the flight by these sounds. Um, so night flight calling phenomenon. Um, has anyone heard these calls? Got a few people back here. I'll play some more examples. Um, they give these calls, especially warblers and sparrows, um, and uh, you know, al almost all of them are for maintaining in-flight associations of some sort. Um, you have to realize it's dark up there, and when you have large numbers of birds moving, they do not want to crash into one another. It's very important that they work out their flight uh, spacing, break away, crash into another bird, that's it. So over time, evolutionarily, that's where we think this flight call system sort of came as a uh, form of air traffic control. Um, there's also echolocation, which comes in handy, I think, uh, especially on a, on a foggy morning when they're looking for a place to land or a low cloud ceiling at night. Um, they, get, they definitely get some feedback. Uh, their call comes out of their mouth, it goes down, hits the ground, it comes back up, and they get that constant feedback when they're giving these calls. The interesting thing is there's whole groups like Furios and flycatchers uh, they migrate at night, but they did not give calls, as, as far as we know. And the other thing is catbird, so vociferous during the day. You'd think catbird would be up there making sounds. <laughs> like nothing. Why? <laughs> and maybe they're just utilizing the calls of other birds. Um, so uh, early or American ornithological literature has some, a few papers that discuss night flight calls. Uh, the first one was uh, George Libby. 1899 near Madison, Wisconsin, he sat on a hill and counted the number of little chip notes, the little boys and sparrows going over, and he counted 4,000 or something like that. Um, and you get uh, this paper here by Kopman, the first paper to describe the uh, night flight call of the Veery. Howells, uh, 2012, this is somewhere in New England, um, figured out, uh, he counted the olive back thrush which is now our Swainson's thrush, and, and it has a beautiful spring peeper like call at night, and he counted those. Um, and then Tyler, the first, uh, and I think he was based in Massachusetts, the first person to describe oven bird night flight call. Now back in the, uh, about the late 50s, uh, a fellow named Richard Graber, based at the Illinois Natural History Survey, um, got very curious about night migration. He teamed up with a guy named Bill Cochran. And um, they, uh, Cochran was an electrical engineer at the University of Illinois and designed this recording system. Now, he couldn't just go buy a uh, computer and, you know, so back in the late 50s, there wasn't a lot off the shelf and everything had to be developed. So Cochran developed this system of reel-to-reel -reel tape that would record 10 minutes out of every hour. And then they would sample 10 minutes out of every hour all through the night, go back and listen to the calls and try to identify it. And the calls and make some sense out of it. They use this big parabolic dish and the hay bales for, for blocking uh, other extraneous environmental sounds. So I got into this um, in about 1985. I was out camping in eastern Minnesota and I uh, heard this huge flight and I uh, basically dropped everything and started doing this. So I have been doing this continuously since 1985. Back then, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know, I thought Swainson's thrushes were Phoebe's. I knew nothing. And I started with the little literature that was out there and I went down to visit uh, Graver and Cochran. Um, 
And, uh, you know, just started working at it. And uh, eventually, um, I developed these little homemade microphones. You can still go to the website, oldbird.org. And for $35, $40, you can build your own microphone for tuning in. Um, it's a little more involved with that. And not that many people actually do it, but a bunch of kids have done it through the years. And uh, I've actually now got a, I realized that not that many people were building their own, so I had to build one and, and sell it. And I've got these, and this is a really good microphone. This is what Richard bought that's um, on the roof here. And uh, so that sound you're hearing earlier is from one of these on the roof, which is the end of the sky. It's got about a 60 degree cone going up of enhanced sensitivity. Uh, these are some earlier models. Um, all right, now we get to the quiz. <laughs> All right, the first one's easy, mainly because I already have the picture up there. <laughs> but uh, if you hear this, if you're out walking your dog at night, and you hear geese going over, you know they're geese. How? How do you know they're geese? You can't see them at night. If you hear this sound, it's the same sound you hear when you're out, right? How do you know that there's not some European vagrant flock? Article piece. Not just be flying over, but has a very similar sound. It's sort of an odd sound when you can't piece. What about this one? Listen very carefully. Upland sand thing. You could hear that going over your house. There's still a few left. Now, coyotes do migrate at night also. I don't think so. Just go. But that's the call we're pressing. You can hear it starts out weak, gets louder, and then it'll get weaker again because, again, if you have a fixed microphone, the birds are flying over the call. They get louder, not raven. Close. They're closer. they got to get down the species. Black Panther. Black Panther. Yeah. What? Was it Black Panther? Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Every one of you, every one of you can get this bird flying over your house and fall. Every one of you. Uh, because it's their coming. They're, they're heading somewhere south. Fall. Um, I don't know where they're going. I don't know. They make this call during the day, you can't hear it. Um, now the next one's harder. But there's a couple weaker calls that are thinner than leaving. So the key thing here is this is a wonderful way to build up your yard list. <laughs> That's least, and that's the real. Oh, sorry, I'm sore already. Swainson's thrush, headed down to northern South America, moving over for lunch. 
Okay, so now we get to the real hard stuff. This is the warblers and sparrows. These are those short little chips I was trying to point out earlier. So I'm going to first play American Red Start Night Flight Call. And again, these were learned by a 15-year effort by myself and a guy named Michael O'Brien from Cape May. And we studied the flight calls of these birds for a long time during the day. And then we matched them spectrographically with these unknown calls going on at night. So here's uh, American Red Star. And you're going to get quizzed on this, so pay attention to whether, I mean, I'm going to do a quiz at the end. I'm going to play four species. Um, pay attention to whether it's a rising note, a descending note, a buzzy note, or a pure tone note. Two calls. Oops, hold on a second. I got back to you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Ready? All right. That was American Red Star. That's the spectrogram. It goes down and then up. I'll play it. Uh, let's do that one more time. You gotta be quick. But that's what it looks like spectrographically. And uh, spectrographically, this is frequency on the y-axis and time. So this is only 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second long. That's why it's so hard. Uh, so let me, uh, okay, here's American Red Star. Next one's black and white warbler. That has a little buzz to it. Next one is Canada. And then white throated sparrow. All right, so now, here's the quiz part. All right, ready? Here's your first quiz. I think you're right. <laughs> next one. Let's well, hear the red start again. The one you think is red start. And then I'll play the next one. I think black and white's probably a good guess. Okay, let's try it again. Red start, red start. Probably the black and white, and then Canada. Canada, yeah. And then finally, the other one. Longer, longer. Wow. Why is their sound so different? sing songs in there. They're just air traffic control. I'm here, where are you? This is the 29th of September, 1959. 29th of September, 1959. sound is, I mean, when you hear that, we're hearing that man, Dick Raver. That's his actual, that's a tape. I went to University of Illinois and got some of the original tapes and archived them at Cornell when I used to work at Cornell. And um, to preserve those for the future. Mm -hmm. And that's really where I, what I see this whole effort is about is, you know, we, we go out and we bird watch here and now, but we're in this big, huge thing of life going on who knows how long. It goes on a long time. But I remember when I was a kid growing up and I, I, I had this realization. I was a birder and I really wanted to see, I just had this urge, what this place was like 500 years ago, what North America was like. 
before Western Europeans came and all the <coughs> changes have happened. And you can't get that. It's gone. And so, you know, I, I, I think a lot of this for me is about getting, you know, documenting, realizing how powerful this monitoring technique is. Because we can record on that night of uh, August 25, 26, a week or so ago, two weeks ago now, over this building, that's the only I have analyzed so far, we had 665 warbler experiments. That doesn't even count the thrushes. And that's a medium night. We're going to get 1,000 warbler nights here. Because uh, this is a great location for recording. And uh, so one of the things, uh, I have a station, the closest station that I've been monitoring night flight calls is down near Albany, New York. It's a little village called Chatham. Chatham. And uh, it's on this side of the mountain, on the west side of the mountains. There's a picture of the microphone. You can see some of the city there. It's right downtown. Not a bad place. You get car noise, but you don't have insects. When you're trying to war uh, monitor warblers and sparrows, insects are the worst thing. Car noise, you can filter out. And um, so I'm going to show you some of the data from Canada warbler. Here's the breeding range of Canada warbler. Um, and this is where they winter in northern South America. And they have these, this migration route. And when they fly, they give that call that you get sort of a rough chip like note. So what I've been doing at this site is I have five years of data from 2012 to 2016. And this is the sort of average ratio of Canada warbler night flight calls to all warbler and sparrow night flight calls um, on a weekly running average here. So you see you get uh, from that site th there in uh, uh, Eastern New York, Canada warblers from mid-August are peaking at about 3%. So three out of 100 calls will be Canada warbler on out of here. Here, here, your Canada warbler is going to be higher. I can tell just by listening to that one night, 25, 26. It was like 30, 40% Canada warbler. I mean, not quite that high, but it was much higher than 3%. Um, so, you know, Thanks to uh, Richard for bringing this microphone here. And I'm going to push for North Branch to record here and get, get at least three to five years of data. And get this data archived, get it out there, put it online, take out the good recordings and put them on the website. And, uh, you know, and get that baseline data now. Because once it's gone, it's gone. We lost last night. We'll never go back and get last night. But one night isn't critical. But season data, if you get a few seasons together, you start to paint a picture of, of what the acoustic pattern is here. And even though we haven't exactly figured out how to connect that to, um, you know, to population, because not all birds call when they migrate at night, and uh, some of them call at different rates. But, you know, when you go out and do your bird, uh, if you do, anyone does breeding bird surveys and stuff, you don't get all the birds. It's just a sample. It's just an index. So that's, this is another independent index for the species that vocalize in that migration. Um, I have done uh, a little bit of monitoring in Vermont, but not much. In 1997, upon uh, Mount Mansfield with Vins, um, we had a station for the fall. And unfortunately, that was all on high five VCR tape. <laughs> and I've only got uh, one night that I managed to digitize. I have, um, it's, it's tricky. Um, so I lost a lot of the data. But that was Mount Mansfield, uh, just east of here. And it was a mid-September night with a few swains and thrushes calling. Um, I did an acoustic study on Glebe Mountain. It's about 3,000 feet. It's south of here in Vermont. And I had one microphone station in, in uh, spring and fall 2004, 2005, I think. On the, on the top and one at the bottom. And in both seasons, there was a lot more migration, especially in spring, in the valley. Um, and uh, that's something now I can go back and, and put that online. That wind project never ended up being built. Um, Oldbird.org, we've got some tools here. There's people all over starting to make better software. Um, and, you know, this is hopefully going to be a real citizen and group effort over the next decade or two to really automate this so you can wake up in the morning and see what was flying, you know, with computers automatically recognizing the identity of the species. 
and Cornell's working on it. Um, lots of folks are working on it, and it's going to be a fun, you know, it's just modern bird watching in the future. In the meantime, you can build your $35 microphone and uh, put it on your roof. Um, if, you, if you're really interested in building your yard list or tuning in. Um, but, uh, yeah. So are power companies hiring you to, you know, when they're doing siting for wind farms and things like that? I used to do, uh, I used to get a lot of jobs from power companies uh, siting wind energy. And then uh, when they started to push into some dense migration areas, yeah. I ended up being hired by the opposite side. And after that, I stopped getting hired by the <laughs> so, um, It's an interesting, very political world, wind energy. And um, we need it, because we don't have any other better alternatives. So um, there's places for it, and there's also places where it shouldn't go. Um, um, a little side story here. I used to work for Nick Graber when I was a grad student. Incredible. Wow. wow. <laughs> Here's the sad part, though. Uh, you would go out in the, on the migration at, uh, fall, on the night or in the morning following a foggy night to go to the uh, television, radio and television tower. Yeah. Because the migrating birds would home in on the, the lights. Mm -hmm. And we picked up from one night, one night, from three towers, 3,000 dead migrating. Mm -hmm. yeah. And most didn't count the 10,000 that were out in the cornfield flopping around. Mm -hmm. And there were every species you can imagine. Greaves, catbirds, finches, warblers. Uh, it's astonishing. That's, um, I, I'd love to talk with you afterwards. I, I had a chance to come up. But um, I'll just say that, um, that I, I co-sponsored the first workshop trying to address that problem in 1999 at Cornell. And, um, with Fish and Wildlife Service, and we brought in FAA, the uh, FEC, and all the agencies. And after, uh, and, and it, I mean, it's, it's a really wonderful story, but it was really American Bird Conservancy with the threat of lawsuits that pushed it. And that's the way things get done in America. And um, after about a 10 year effort, uh, we at least got the, um, the lighting. Uh, on towers change to a, a one that won't attract birds as much. At least the problem is, is that there's 50,000 towers and they're sort of grandfathered in with the old lighting system. But as soon as they get updated, theoretically that problem will go away. The other thing is, is that with that problem is that as the cities expanded from the 1950s and 60s when Graver was doing that work, um, the light dome from cities engulfed these towers that had the isolated aviation have obstruction warning lights that attracted the birds to the death because they would hit the guy wires. And, uh, you know, and I think the record was something like 25,000 birds in one night in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Um, but, uh, but now it's not happening as much at those towers. Towers that used to kill thousands of birds a night are only killing, I mean a year, are now only killing hundreds. And these are the big tall TV towers. And um, it's the guy wires. It's the guy wires, right. And the lights bring them in and then they don't see the guy wires. Um, so, you know, probably the reason we're not finding as many now um, is uh, lower bird populations, lower density. There's still a lot of birds up there, but lower than it was. But also, you have to, in order to study that light attraction problem, you have to get into dark terrain and, and study towers there. Um, you know, and other light sources. It can happen with a lot of other light sources, too. Uh, that's great piece of historical information. Wonderful. You just made my whole trip, besides <laughs> everything else about this trip. <laughs> uh, yeah? As the equipment becomes more citizen-friendly, I wonder if there's any possibility for citizens to get up on mountains all in a coordinated manner so that we can know uh, as citizens and begin to apply pressure regarding the question about power installations. Um, we don't really know, I think, which mountains are always strong migratory routes, or whether the, the patterns change as they probably do with weather, yeah. or whether there's some mountains that would make good sites for uh, power for, for wind and others. We don't have that information. And forget the, the companies, they're not going to hire anyone anymore. But what about citizen? What about the possibility of the citizen movement to begin to get the information to provide meaningful data pressure 
Well, you're, yeah, you're right on whether it's citizen or you know other uh, other forms of getting that data. Um, I mean, certainly citizens can participate in it, but it, you have to get the data and have it in place before the energy installation is proposed, ideally. Because you're right, you're not going to get the funding from the industry, and if you are, it'll be maybe a study right at that spot. But they don't they don't understand the bigger picture. And uh, in Vermont, I can tell you just from my experience uh, with other places, the nocturnal migration here is very complex because of the montane terrain and, uh, and how weather shapes wind currents in these valleys and, and things. So it is literally unknown. Anyone, you know, and uh, maybe this station will be the first long-term site in the state to start gathering data, but where you get, and this is what Bill Cochran told me uh, back in 1994, he got all excited about this idea of automatically monitoring these calls, is that every additional station you have running simultaneously gives you different information. So if you have, like I did on Glebe, where you have one at the top and one at the bottom, just those two stations, you get a tremendous amount of information. Um, and so it wouldn't take that many stations. You could have if you've got six stations, some up high and some down low, they're doing that in Montana. There's a big effort in Montana now, the similar Montana terrain, to try to understand. And who's paying for it? In that case, you've got a guy that made a billion dollars in the stock market, uh, <laughs> short, you know, shorting out. He has figured out some way to do it in very tiny millis milliseconds. And uh, he made all this money, and then he, he, he's got a good heart and he put it into buying ranches and restoring them ecologically in the West. Mm -hmm. And one of those ranches called MPG Ranch um, has, you know, he hired like 30 biologists there and one of the biologists really got the vision to study the night migration through the calls. And they have been a, they've really de helped develop the software in, uh, in recent years. So there are pockets of money out there. It's not always clean. You do the best you can. <laughs> <laughs> I have done that um, in one of the, while well, I was still at Cornell in 1994, we put out a bunch of microphones, like eight microphones in an array. And then you triangulate the arrival times, so a bird might call off to the side, and it, the sound arrives at the closer microphones first. And by calculating those arrival time delays, uh, you can approximate where the bird <coughs> call from in the sky. And, um, and then you plot that, you get hundreds and hundreds of calls, and you plot that, and you sort of get a pickup pattern of the microphone. And there's some of that online, um, on, on one of the publications, but it really hasn't, um, and Cornell did a study after I left, but it's not, uh, that's the way to do it, but it hasn't been done very much. Um, the interesting thing I found was that a lot of warblers and sparrows were flying lower, uh, and well, it was more that the Swainson's thrushes were not flying low. They were up high, and it gets back to this whole idea of maybe echo location, because they have a louder call. And basically, there's so much more that needs to be learned, or that is available to be learned. And, um, and that is one, that's a really good question about the pickup pattern of the microphone and, um, and, and how different species. Uh, stratify in the atmosphere. Um, you might get geese and things flying, obviously, much higher. They typically sound high when they're we're getting those fall flights from uh, Quebec down to the mid Atlantic. Um, whereas the warblers and sparrows, I mean, these, this microphone only picks them up, up to about a thousand feet. So we know that, that's a limitation. Whereas thrushes, at least 2,000 feet, they have a louder call, and geese probably up to 5,000 feet. Um, so, you know, it's an index. You get the data and you, you uh, compare changes in the data through time. You, to try to do it absolutely, to calibrate exactly how much you're picking up, varies with wind direction, varies with humidity, all sorts of things. So you can really, really nail it. It's a very um, uh, more intensive study than something like this. And that's the same as the breeding bird survey. Breeding bird survey where people are just going out and stopping, you know, every uh, half mile for three minutes. Um, that's not very intense, but ultimately it gives us um, 
what we still what we have right now is the best information on whether bird pop, uh, songbird populations are increasing and declining. So. Okay, I am still trying to wrap my head around the whole idea of identifying the flight call when you don't get visual confirmation. Can you talk a little bit more about how you guys started to look at spectrograms and be like, yep, those that goes together? Well, you know, if you have a flock of geese, you start when you hear. You beginning. start with like. Yeah. You start with geese. <laughs> okay. Okay. You start with geese. Okay. Yeah, I know that one. <laughs> and then you keep working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, hooded warbler, I worked on for six years, and um, it took a long time. And I went to a barrier island off the coast of Texas. I waited for fallout, and I happened to get it like April 6th one year. And I got out there, and there were birds all over the dunes and everything. And I found some hooded warblers. There were three of them sitting in a bush, <laughs> in a little little tiny bush. And I just waited until they took off. Because oftentimes when they come in from the fallouts, they come down and they rest after flying across the Gulf. They rest a little bit, but they don't want to be out on those dunes. Yeah. And uh, so they'll rest a little bit, and then they'll fly out and look for better habitat. Mm -hmm. And I waited there, and they took off, and I got the call. And that one little tenth of a second yeah. opened the door. Because mm -hmm. once I saw it, it was pretty much safe. Is that the kind of thing? Yeah, wow. It, it's just like you know those long evolutionary periods, um, which came first, the chicken or the egg. It's, yeah. It gets really nebulous, but uh, all I can tell you is if you keep working at it, you get better. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff I don't know, um, and it gets lumped in, you know, complexes like the Zeep complex. Can you so you can you do like Zeep sparrow, <laughs> like soup, you know, warbler. Right? Well, like, some of, there there are some uh, the interesting thing is warblers and sparrows aren't. They have some overlap. Some yeah. warblers can be like sparrows and, and vice versa. So, um, you know, and it's like right now, Connecticut warblers probably migrating over us. But they have a zeep call that's just like black black bull, which is also migrating over. So, if you hear a zeep, you don't know whether well, you can't do Connecticut warbler at night. You can't even confidently do black bull, other than <laughs> lots more of them are moving over. So, you know, it's like the way I, I make the analogy of a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. You get the easy, distinctive ones, and things like Swainson's thrush are very distinctive. Uh, but you don't know one until you know them all. That's the other problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, because just because you hear something that sounds like something you recorded during the day, you have to make sure there's nothing else out there that sounds okay. similar. Um, so it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You work your way around, and, uh, and you you, you base it on what the possibilities are. Um, you know a warbler call is not a Canada goose. A Canada goose just can't do that. So it's like that. You, you know what it is, and you also know what it isn't, and you zero in on it. Well, thank you. Can, like, thanks for all the, the foundational work that you've done to give us like those audio files that give us some place to start. Right. And that's wow, a good, six years. Well, that was yeah, just for that one piece. I mean, I mean it wasn't like that's what I was doing all the time. For every species, <laughs> for every species though, you have some kind of, there's been some kind of visual confirmation, though. Right? Well, the real genius, yeah, and the real genius uh, of the guide that Michael O'Brien and I put out in 2002, which is now, I should say, online. If you go to publications here, and I've heard it, there's two links. One is flight calls in Eastern North America, Lambert's in Eastern North America. And there you can see the groundwork we did with getting the you know a bird ID during the day flying, giving the call type. We have those, and then we have the hypothetical, hypothetical or presumed, you know, similar spectrographic ones that we've recorded at night that we presume are the same species. Which um, birds are you still working on, or are you working on them still? Well, some really interesting thing on Wilson's warbler, the uh, in, the western subspecies have distinctive night flight calls. For oven bird, there's seven different kinds of calls. Yeah. I don't know if it's male or female, uh, different populations. And then it gets much more than that. You get into uh, how, especially like something like Henslow Sparrow, it's really hard to get their night flight call. You know, very unlikely that you get it here, but in New York, you're still getting a few. Um, but they, each population seems to have its own, so it's all the same species, but each population has its own type of flight call, and the flight call is also the location call for most sparrows that they give during the day when they're in high brush and stuff. So, so. Do you have anything on hummingbirds? 
Um, well, we put those, because we did a land bird flight call, and we put hummingbird chip notes on there. And I know that uh, you know, sh very short, high notes. Um, I've never recorded anything that I thought was from a hummingbird at night. Um, but, uh, you know, they do come across the Gulf of Mexico. If you're on, in like, Fort Morgan down in Alabama and you're waiting for the flight to come in from Yucatan that morning, you see hummingbirds coming in with the songbirds. So I presume that they also migrated then, uh, at least some point. Has anybody been working, I mean, with like, at banding stations, has anybody come up with a chip to be able to record on the actual bird? Yeah, um, a number of folks at Powder Mill uh, Banding Station in near Pittsburgh, they, um, a guy named Mike Lanzone who's now developed these little light locators and he's got a business, you know, uh, supplying those for re you know, bird, re bird migration researchers around yeah. the world. But he uh, sort of started the bioacoustics program there. And what he did was he took the warblers and, uh, that were banded and he held them for a little while in these cages and then he would record the calls that they made during the night. Now that was an idea that I had and when Gr Dick Graber was still alive, I went to see him in 1986. And unfortunately he just had a stroke. He couldn't remember a lot from the early days in the, in the 60s. Um, but when I gave him that idea, I said, uh, well, why don't we just ban birds and put them in cages and record these calls? And he said, well, you can try that. And he's a very Jimmy Stewart one. <laughs> sort of Illinois accent. And uh, he said, well, you know what you can do? You can go to tower kills and get the injured birds and do it with those. Oh, That's how sensitive he was. He didn't, I mean, it wasn't that he was against banding, but, you know, um, uh, you know, he was just a very sensitive man. And that influenced me, and so I never did that. Um, and it turns out that when you do put them in cages at night, there's some species you get zero information from. And some species, you do get it. I mean, you do make some progress that way. Uh, so there's been a couple manuscripts in the AUK, I think, um, some new ontological literature that's uh, made some progress. With it. I, I wasn't thinking of keeping them in a cage, but just somehow being able to mic them. Oh, put a microphone on them. Mm -hmm. um, well, Bill Cochran, Dick Graber's colleague at University of Illinois, put the first microphones on any bird, I think, uh, night migrants, put them on swings and thrushes. I mean, you drive like crazy in the station oh, yeah. <laughs> you got speeding tickets. <laughs> he's, uh, he's in his late 80s. He's a genius, wonderful person. He still lives in Champaign, Illinois. And uh, he, uh, I mean, his stories on track, you know, following night migrating thrushes are just fantastic. There's lots of stuff written. And I got some of his recordings of the swings and thrush vocalizing. And it transmits the sound to him in the station wagon driving nine miles an hour. <laughs> 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 what about whippoorwills? Do you have any data on whippoorwills? I don't know. Uh, I've never recorded them in night migration. I, obviously, I mean, I know they migrate at night, and um, you know we hear them calling crepuscularly in the mornings and at, you know in the evening. They certainly don't give their whippoorwill while they're migrating. I wouldn't record it. They might give a little chuck note occasionally, but a lot of species do migrate silently. Um, and that, I think, is one of them. Nighthawk, a pretty vociferous during the day. Um, in the fall, I don't know, some people have said they've seen nighthawks here in the last week. Um, do you hear them calling at this time of year? I'm just curious. Do you hear at this time of year you're hearing that call? You've seen any silent ones I've been seeing. Yeah. Uh, but I have reported, you know, their flight call at night occasionally. Um, so it's possible whipper will make some of the similar species that might make some sound. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, species that migrate separately by gender, like redwings. Yeah. Do they have different nighttime calls? Well, the red wings, red wing blackbirds migrate mostly by day, they do come across the Gulf of Mexico you know, with the night migrants. So they, they could migrate at night too. There's a lot of unknowns about that. But uh, uh, I think that the work of Mike Lanzone and Andy Farnsworth at Cornell, when they had the birds in cages, showed that for some species, there are differences between male and female. And especially with immatures. Like rose-breasted grosbeak has a very, the immatures have a very distinctive night flight call. 
but versus the adults. Um, and Caspi, in turn, is one of those cases where you don't get the male and female, uh, but you know the prehistoric sort of rah, that the Caspi and turns give. Uh, you'll hear those calls and then the high-pitched calls of the young with them at in, inland areas at night migration. Um, so those are moving as family groups. And maybe the, the adults are showing the young where to go in, in night migration. So. Yeah. So. This might seem a little off topic, but uh, for years I studied humpback whales. And um, I recorded them. And then we would study them, put the song on spectrograms. And I would do like some fast forward, you know, many times with my earphones on. And it sounds exactly like bird songs. I've heard that too. Yeah. Up. yeah. And probably similarly for, for bird songs, if you slow it down, it probably sounds like humpback whale songs. In the lab, the lab where I first started the work. Katie Payne? With Katie Payne and Chris That's Clark. Work with. Are you yeah. still working with Katie? Or? Not. Yeah. She's working with elephants now. Yeah. yeah. So that's where a lot of this software. So I came to yeah. Cornell and uh, first worked in the Library of Natural Sounds in 1988. And uh, then in 1994, I came back as a, a lowercase sort of laboratory associate to collaborate with the bioacoustics program there to develop software for automatically recognizing these calls. And Richard and I just talked to a fellow um, who wrote. Uh, he, he wrote the first version of uh, some of the software uh, that uh, has been used for that. But anyway, I see I've only got about five minutes before our next speaker comes on here, so I want to give her time to get set up. I'd love to talk to you afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh.